All right, everybody, I'm very excited to introduce everyone to my friend, Yevgeny Trufkin, author of The Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide. Uh, it's a really good book. I basically met Yevgeny almost a year ago, right? Yeah, time flies. Actually, I think the course was in September, right? Yeah, so about yeah, so. 11 months. We took yeah. Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Level 2 at the Czech Institute. And my first impression was Yevgeny was, he's uh, very calm. And I thought he was a little quiet, but I think that's just because he understood most of the things that the instructor was talking about. So he didn't have too many questions and it just sort of clicked with him. And a fun fact about when I saw him, he's the first person I've ever seen eat a bell pepper, like an apple. And I recently started doing that and it tastes amazing. So I want to thank you for that. Yeah, no uh, problem. <laughs> he's basically a personal trainer who's very passionate about nutrition. And I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, I think that's a great introduction. Um, I've been, I kind of specialize in fat loss and I try to take a, like a holistic approach to fat loss because I feel there are like many variables, like sometimes even a myriad of variables responsible for a person kind of gaining weight to begin with. And then kind mm -hmm. of like it has to be addressed through that variety of variables to kind of see lasting change. So I've kind of been doing that for kind of like stop counting the years after a certain time, but I'm pretty sure like about 12 to 13 years already. Nice. Uh, so quite a while. And then I've been kind of honestly in health and wellness, like my whole entire life, like I grew up on a biodynamic farm in Ukraine. So kind of learned the importance of, you know, high quality food production there in terms of like producing food actually like naturally how it's, uh, how it would be produced anyways without people there. So kind of learned a lot about those practices and, um, yeah, just my dad took me to the gym at like, I don't know, like six or seven. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> forced me to train and then I've been working out since then dude just really kind of like enjoy um kind of like a health centered health centered lifestyle yeah nice that's awesome well I'm kind of new to this lifestyle I grew up eating terribly for the first 22 23 years of my life it wasn't until a couple years ago I was always an athlete so I always exercised but I never felt like I was living to full capacity so when I started learning about nutrition, I had no idea that there was a whole new world to explore when it comes to like free range, organic, biodynamic, and all that other stuff. I just thought finding the right things at first is important, but now that I know what to put in my body and what to eat, I think your book really helped find me, help me to find the right sources. So I want to let you get into a little bit about that. We basically have a section on vegetables and fruit, eggs, and then all the meat. I want to I want to let you talk about the importance of why not getting conventional or not getting organic vegetables and fruits could be detrimental to someone's health. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into into that topic alone. So um, I guess the the biggest thing to remember is typically like at a when you're looking to buy vegetables and fruits, there are, there are a lot of categories, but typically the three big ones are kind of like the conventionally farmed or factory farm model, the supermarket organic or like organic uh, produce in general, and then also the uh, biodynamically produced uh, like vegetables and fruits. So uh, I do like a lot of grocery store tours where I take people through the grocery store and I kind of teach them about food production practices and I'll try to kind of like keep this a bit short, uh, but basically, Three reasons why people, there are three myths why people kind of buy the cheaper like factory farmed vegetables because a lot of people like for the most part, they know that it's grown with chemicals, mm -hmm. but there are three myths that kind of make it acceptable to keep purchasing, purchasing that produce. So um, one of the biggest, one of the first myths is like basically that these chemicals are um, test like thoroughly, thoroughly tested for safety. Mm -hmm. And basically, as a pesticide company, which actually has like a lot more uh, safety testing than other chemicals, uh, especially if it's used for agriculture, they're only responsible, basically, there are two ingredients in a, in a chemical formulation. There are the active ingredients and the inactive ingredients. And they're only responsible for safety testing of the active ingredient in isolation on its own. Wow. They never actually have to test like the complete formulation as a whole. So like common sense would basically 
at least if I was a scientist, I'm like, I'll take the finished product, I'll spray it on this crop and then see if it causes damage, you know? But it's not the case. They only have to basically test the active ingredient in isolation on its own for safety. But get this, the inactive ingredients are responsible for actually increasing the potency and the lifespan of the active ingredient. So obviously when you take the inactive ingredient out of the equation, Much the active ingredient is gonna be a lot weaker. So it might pass safety testing of some sort. And another problem is all of this safety testing is done in-house at the chemical companies with their scientists. Yeah, they're, they're, so, they're getting paid to prove their, the results that they want basically. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of like uh, if you're in college, it's like the, the teacher letting you grade your own exam, <laughs> letting yeah. you grade your own exam, you know, that's a great analogy. And then, yeah. And then they take these results and then they send them to the FDA or the EPA and then they evaluate the results. But they have so, no idea about the study, who's who is funding the study, who did the study and who's on whose paycheck. basically. Well, yeah, the chemical companies are the ones funding the studies and then the people hired by them or their employees are the ones that are running, that are running the studies, basically. Yeah. Um, and then, like, another problem with that is they just test these chemicals in isolation one at a time. But in a typical crop production season, they might use, like, 7 to 14 different chemicals in a single season on a single mm -hmm. crop. Yeah. And that's never, like these myriad of chemicals in the real world scenario and are never tested for safety. Yeah. So it's like uh, the average, um, the, I, I forget the study, but the average newborn in America has like some trace amounts of 200 different chemicals in their bloodstream. Wow. So, and okay, take that into consideration. And they're just doing safety for one active ingredient in isolation on its own in a tested environment, presuming that they're using this exact dosage where out in the field, they're also probably using much higher, much higher dosages as well. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, that's a huge misconception there because a lot of people are like, Oh, the, these organizations, the government requires them to do such thorough testing. There's no way they could be harmful to my body. Well, it's, it's not, it's not the case. And uh, people can check out a book called, the Myths of Safe Pesticides by Andre Liu. It's, um, it's a pretty solid book. The first time I read it, I thought the guy was definitely, although he had like a bunch of peer reviewed studies in there, like many, many, I thought he was just exaggerating. And then I started researching this topic a lot more. And it turns out that it's not an, it's not an exaggeration. It really kind of like is the case. Yeah. And um, I imagine that while they're doing the testing, it's not at different temperatures either. And how often do we eat foods that are cooked and at different temperatures? And what does that do to the, do you know, do you have any idea what that does to the chemicals? Yeah, I, I'm not like a thoroughly, I don't thoroughly understand the whole entire science behind it. But yes, cooking chemicals on certain heats, especially elevated heats could increase the potency wow. of that or the toxicity of that chemical as well. I don't know which, which pesticides because there are thousands of biocides on the market in general so i don't know exactly which one that happens to but yes mm -hmm. that could be the case but the most important thing to remember is kind of like the safety testing is done on an active ingredient that's not present with the ingredients that make it a lot stronger mm -hmm. so obviously that's very important to consider another another thing is a lot of people tell me like oh you could like wash it off it's not a big deal but you have to understand that most pesticides are systemic pesticides yeah. so they're meant to be soaked up by the roots In of the, the plants yeah. exactly meant to be soaked up by the roots of the plant and actually become embedded as part of the body of the vegetable and fruit mm -hmm. and the bulk of the trace amounts of pesticides are actually in the actual like flesh nutrition. of yeah in the it's part of the nutritional profile of the crop and there whatever you wash off on the on the top sure there are trace amounts on the surface as well, but it's like overall like a small percentage of the overall amount of pesticides present in in the in the crop. And yeah. for instance, like sometimes people say, um, uh, a lot of times they have like a mental image with the fact that they're like, oh, you know, they just sprinkle like a little teeny bit on the produce. You know what I mean? Uh, it's barely airplanes it's, flying by. Yeah, exactly. They have like airplanes, these huge trucks, I mean, like spraying like millions and millions of gallons of this stuff into the soil uh, nationwide every every single year, if not billions. I don't know the exact number, but it's a lot. And like, for instance, I remember reading like one study done by the FDA and they took like a random 
batch, like any random batch of strawberries has trace amounts in the US has trace amounts of like 20 different pesticides, mm -hmm. just like a single batch of strawberries. You yeah, know? That's insane. And once again, the safety testing we talked about, one active ingredient in isolation on its own. And here, just in one batch of strawberries, you have 20 different pesticides working in synergy with one another. Yeah. So, um, and there's no idea the dangers that happen when when you have a combination. Although there is some idea because we're pretty unhealthy as in general as a nation. So, I yeah, tell exactly. You something. Yeah, I mean, another thing is people come up to me and they're like, "Oh, I've been eating this stuff my whole entire life, and I feel just fine." Like, meanwhile, they're like obese they have all sorts of joint issues they're only like 35 on top of that and they're taking like two or three pharmaceuticals and also they need like four cups of coffee just to get through the day like every single day and maybe like mm -hmm. monster energy to come back so yeah. in my opinion like everyone has their own perception obviously but in my opinion that doesn't that doesn't equate to doing fine yeah, you know I what i mean and the so, absence the absence of disease does not equal health someone could look healthy on the outside but feel like crap feel like shit on the inside so yeah and most of them they don't look that good on the outside and they don't feel that good on the inside you know yeah, so you got double true. negative there um yeah. but yeah and, and then the other one is like the third most common one uh is basically to answer your question is like a lot of people are like oh the trace amounts are too small i mean i can't even visually see them for the most part mm -hmm. but if you look up like a lot of studies on pubmed.gov especially through like seralini labs uh and i'm sure there are like many many other researchers you'll see that even in a lot of these chemical formulations like one drop one part per trillion which is one drop in three size swimming pools like olympic size swimming pools has a hormonal effect on your body wow yeah, and unfortunately, it's not like increasing your testosterone through the roof, which I wish it was the case. Yeah, it's actually I'd be most likely. That too. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, dude, <laughs> give pre-workout protus exactly. But it's like it's usually it just bumps your estrogen up like through the roof, and um, that's not something you want. That's kind of going out of control, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's the conventional. That's the conventional produce. Uh, at the supermarket level, I mean you have the USDA organic, or sometimes mm -hmm. it says organic uh label and that's kind of like honestly that's your best bet at decreasing your exposure to synthetic pesticides that's 100 percent your best bet at the supermarket level so 99 percent of people they're just going to go to the supermarket no matter what yeah because um it's it's not as convenient to go to the farmer's market during their limited hours mm -hmm. and um the only problem i have with the usda organic seal is Kind of like I remember I talked to you about this a uh, little while back, but basically a lot of the produce, and this is only legal in the US, it's not legal, at least from my understanding, like anywhere else, is basically like a lot of the produce is produced not even uh not even in soil anymore. Yeah. The a lot of the organic farms, right? Yeah, exactly. And for people that don't know, it's like basically like a shipping container. Uh, or like a huge warehouse and they, it's basically looks like a science lab and they have all these like crops like hanging through IV drips, you know, it kind of mm -hmm. looks like a medical facility almost or, or something even, like, does it yeah, even get like sunlight? Agri nope. Uh, it doesn't get sunlight. It's wow. usually through artificial light. And uh, remember that scene in the matrix mm -hmm. when they kind of like finally see the matrix and they see all these like harvesting things. Oh Yeah. It's kind of like, it looks like pretty much like that. I mean, wow. like not as cool as that, but like kind of give you an idea, you know, of how it looks. So that's so, why in here you have conventional as the worst option or factory yep. farmed. The good option is organic. And then let's, let's talk more about the best category, which is biodynamic, because I know I had never heard of biodynamic until you introduced me to it. Yeah, biodynamic farming, they're like obviously very degrees of biodynamic farming, but, but basically the principle is they incorporate animal soils, animal soil and plants into one kind of self-sustaining ecosystem mm -hmm. or like semi-self-sustaining ecosystem. How Maybe it's they found do have in nature some... pretty much. Yeah, exactly. And they kind of, uh, because right now farming these days, it's mostly like this guy grows the carrots, this guy grows the tomatoes, this guy grows the pigs, and they're not in synchrony uh, in synergy with one another yeah it's you know? not a symbiotic relationship anymore yeah exactly so in order to kind of like really 
you have to remember the most important thing in terms of crop production or just like sustaining quality life in general is to have super, super, super healthy soil. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, Paul Check has like a really lengthy, like very old footage on YouTube. It's called um, The Dirt the Facts. Dirt Facts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's the video that I watched maybe like three years ago that really got me second guessing supermarket food. Yep. Because before then, like I grew up on a bi biodynamic farm in Ukraine. I came over here and the food looked the same. I thought it was like, man, these Americans, they mastered biodynamic farming <laughs> you know, to be able to produce this much food. And yeah, so I didn't even question it for the longest time until like I basically watched that video. I was never really into fast food, but I did always just buy the factory farm food at the grocery store level for the most part for a very long time, like places at Costco and stuff like that. And then after watching that, I'm like, oh man, that's like something's like really fishy. Maybe it's not kind of what it looks like on the surface, you know? Yeah. And so that's, that's what kind of incentivized me to research the topic a lot more. And uh, yeah, but basically to get back into your, so people can check out that video. It's very, very good. Uh, but basically to get back into your question, you need like healthy soil and to have healthy soil. You basically need a synergy between animals living on that soil, then the plants, and then obviously like a biodynamic farmer that knows how to manage, it, manage the resources very well so that the soil isn't depleted. Yep. Because last thing you want is monocropping oper operations where they're basically growing almost like the same crop year after year in the same patch of land all the time or with minimal rotation. Yeah, you want to rotate that's, them. Yeah, because that's going to deplete the mineral, uh, the mineral content of the soil. And then obviously when the mineral content of the soil is depleted, you're going to grow weak crops. And when you grow weak crops, pests are nature's way of getting rid of weak crops. Pests mm -hmm. wouldn't be around if you just always have strong and healthy crops all the time. Yep. So obviously, if you're growing these weak crops, then you're going to get a lot of pests. And then when you get a lot of pests, you're going to have to use a lot of synthetic pesticides. And also, like with the supermarket level organic, uh, it varies. Uh, but some of the companies, they do just do monocropping as well for the most part. And they just use a lot of uh, organic chemicals that are approved by the USDA organic program. And those, some of those chemicals, uh, if used to very high degrees, could, could, be, could be toxic and detrimental to the soil as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, but nonetheless, I still stand by the fact that USDA organic vegetables at the supermarket are always going to be way better than the factory farm conventionally farmed vegetables at the supermarket. I would always opt for the organic ones, even if they're produced in hydroponics facilities because just your your exposure to synthetic pesticides is going to be like way 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 less and that's yeah. that's a really a good that's already a very good step in the right direction yeah for your a good health. starting point for anybody yeah and uh, uh at the supermarket you're not going to find basically you're not going to find biodynamically produced vegetables or crops at least i couldn't find them uh and i've searched like quite a bit uh the listener can check out a website called like um eatwild.com yeah you sent me that i've looked into that it's amazing yeah they have like that interactive map which makes it very easy you just click on your state and then it shows you arrows to where are their pasture raised operations where are their biodynamic farms all yeah. that stuff so that's that's I, a very I good have a question for you is biodynamic the same thing as biodiverse because i've seen biodiversity farms so I've, i'm assuming they're the same thing or at least similar yep uh i you know, that's a good question. I presume they're the same. Biodiverse yeah. means they probably have like a lot of different uh, like vegetables and, and fruits, a lot of different, I'm guessing also animals on the farm as well. But I, I basically refer to it as like a biodynamic operation. So nice. So that sort of covers with every topic. Obviously, factory farm, the worst. Organic is your best option at the supermarket. Biodiverse best option possible or biodynamic i'd like for you to now go into explaining the myth about cage-free and free-range animals yeah um personally just as a quick to go to strategy like uh never buy pork and chicken at the supermarket mm -hmm. because in terms of chicken for instance the best you're going to get is the free-range organic which sounds like very, very good. And in a yeah. person's mental, in a typical person's mental eyes, uh, they're going to see chickens roaming around outside in the mm -hmm. fresh air all the time. 
Um, but it's not the case. Usually with free range, like 99% of these operations, you basically have like a huge shed. You probably have like 50,000 chickens in this shed, shoulder to shoulder. They typically have like one square foot or 1.5 square feet per hen. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's like basically a, a sheet of printing paper, average sheet of printing paper. And typically they have like a small little concrete patio where they can kind of go roam outside 24 seven. Now yeah. that's their, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, not even, a lot of times not even 24 seven, a lot of times yeah. just limited hours. Like for instance, there's a free range uh, supplier to Whole Foods, which a lot of people associate with the most credible, healthiest food like imaginable. Uh, and Direct Action Everywhere did like a six month investigation where they went to these free range suppliers uh, and they basically planted hidden cameras outside of these facilities mm -hmm. running 24 seven for like months. And they never saw like a single chicken go outside. Wow. Yeah. And there, so it's basically just like a factory farmed operation. They even took, I think they even took soil samples and they didn't find like any fecal matter anywhere. And remember like a single chicken is pooping like four to five pounds of poop every month. And if you have 50,000 of these chickens, surely you can get like a little bit of poop somewhere in the soil if they're running, running out, uh, roaming outside, you know? Yeah, so that just means they're living in their own bathroom. And I imagine that that small patio is only accessible to about one or 2% of the chickens if you have 50,000 of them in there. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I visited um, like a small amount of free range operations. And basically what you see is uh, you have, 40,000 chickens inside or whatever, like a huge number of shoulder to shoulder, like crawling over each other, just a heavy metal mosh pit. <laughs> That's kind of what I visualized. And then you have like probably like 50 chickens outside yeah. out of those 40,000. So I don't know what percentage that is, but it's like super small. That's insane. And then the, 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 yeah, the bigger takeaway in terms of your health, that's the ethics of raising a bird. Obviously there's a lot mm -hmm. of debate, you know, like some people don't care about the animal and some people do, but this topic right here should affect anyone that's looking to be healthy and no matter what your goal in, is in life, in my opinion, like health should be number one, because how are you going to achieve it without being healthy, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have to think about like health and wellness that way. The main thing is these birds are not fed a species specific diet. So chickens are kind of like they're omnivores. They eat worms. When was the last time you gave like a worm to a bird and it was like, nah, it's okay. I'm just going <laughs> to have this corn, you know? Yeah, no, dude, I'm good. It like it goes for that bird, it goes for that worm like right away all the time over everything else. It prioritizes that. They eat insects, bugs, grass, uh, other minerals from the ground, uh, stuff of that sort, you know? But yeah. in these, these operations, even if it says organic, even if it says free range, they're fed nothing but grains. They're fed corn nothing but corn and soy, exactly. Yeah. So it's gonna shoot the omega-6 way up through the roof Leave the omega, omega, omega six is an inflammatory micronutrient. Person can look up a thing called like inflammation theory of disease. They'll see like 95 plus percent of disease just arises from chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. If you're eating that three times a day, that's going to contribute to that achy joints, depression, anxiety, gut issues, cancer, whatever, you know, the list goes on. It's very, very long. Um, and it's a dead giveaway because on a lot of these labels, they'll, see, they'll, they'll say vegetarian fed. Yeah. But that's not actually a good thing it's not what <laughs> in that situation. I can't believe it's an advertising tool and people believe it. Yeah, because uh, like the typical American sees like a vegetarian eater, like a human vegetarian eater as like a healthy person, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like kind of like a gimmicky market marketing thing. They'll be like, ah, oh, these chickens are vegetarians too. And by vegetarians, they also mean just like straight up like corn and soy. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're eating kale and all the other good green vegetables. Yeah, exactly. And the problem with corn and soy too, like recently there's a farmer in the U.S. that supplied like, I don't know, like 10% of the soy in the U.S. And he was recently caught like basically uh, changing the paperwork. He was growing all this soy with harmful chemicals and just labeling it organic. Wow. And who knows how many years they did that ha he did this for. And he ended up, he ended up getting 10 years and he committed suicide before he went to jail. I don't mm -hmm. know the name of the story, but people can look it up. Also, another very common thing I'll is... put the link in. Yeah, another very common thing is um, when corn is imported, 
there's a tremendous amount when corn and soy is imported from other countries, there's a tremendous amount of corruption at the broker level. So basically like what happens is they grow corn and soy, like say in Ukraine uh, or Turkey or something, that's a huge exporter to the US as well. And uh, they grow it with synthetic chemicals. Then as they're shipping the containers, the broker just goes like, oh, now this is organic and I get 20% more, changes the paperwork around, changes the labels around and the bam, it gets imported as organic. And the FDA is only kind of auditing probably like 1% maybe of like the incoming, incoming produce. So it's like a huge problem as well. Yeah, and the other issue with buying produce from other countries is if it's not organic, they have a lot less strict pesticide regulations. So the, the pesticides that have become illegal in the United States are being sold to Mexico, sprayed on the crops, crops shipped to the U.S. and being sold anyway. So it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, that's another issue too. Yeah, correct. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's, that's cool. the free range thing. And just as a general rule, uh, after I finish all my research, I just no longer even buy like poultry or pork at the supermarket. Yeah, and from my understanding, cage-free is the same thing as free-range without that little patio that they get to roam around on, right? Yeah, exactly. And the worst part is in terms of, I mean, there's a lot of like uh, give or take in terms of the ethics or morals of how to raise these birds. But at the end of the day, it's like everyone will agree that you ideally want to optimize your health. So the important thing to consider is, once again, those birds in the cage-free label aren't fed a species-specific diet. They're fed, once again, corn and soy, a lot mm -hmm. of it. So it's going to, uh, and typically people eat this food like two to three times a day, like every day for years yep. and years and years. So it's going to add, it's just like a very bad nutritional profile of the food group. So. Yeah. So, so we've got the worst is cage free. The next level is free range. And then let's talk about pasture raised a little bit. Yeah. So pasture raised, um, there are a couple of different pasture raised operations. So one thing is uh, shopping at a small, uh, small local farmer is a hit and miss too, okay? So a lot of times like some health experts would just go, oh, go to your farmer's market. But just like with any self-employed person, just because you're kind of self-employed doesn't mean you're very good at what you do, you know? Mm -hmm. So what you wanna see in like a pasture raised operation when you do go there to a, to a small farmer, some questions to ask. So one, uh, are there basically you want to ask them like what is the size of your flock so basically per acre they should have maybe like 200 300 birds per acre and then are you rotating them daily you know that's important too because if they're uh, a lot of times pasture raised it's they could actually keep them outside all the time but if they're not rotating them the birds are going to eat up the food very, very, eat up the worms and the bugs and the, the mineral content and the grass and everything very, very quickly, especially if you have 200 of them. Because birds literally just wake up and they eat like all day and they go to sleep. So it's kind of like a super laid back lifestyle. And if they're not rotating them onto new pasture, then you have to have a lot of supplemental feed. And what are you going to supplement feed with? What's the most affordable? Corn and soy. Oh. Exactly. So you still run into the same, same problem, you know? And then you would have to ask that farmer, I mean, is your corn and soy organic, you know, even if they are using it. Uh -huh. uh, so another thing you could ask for, and this is kind of like a rare find, but I do see some companies offering them here and there. I think one company is Grassroots um, Farmers or something. I forgot exactly. I think Primal oh, Pasture, yeah, I think PrimalPastures.com offers like soy free, um, possibly corn free as well. I know theirs is 100% pasture raised, but I forgot the degree of which they supplement with corn and soy. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, uh, good, another good question to ask is like, uh, so two, are you raising about two to 300 birds per acre? Uh, uh, two, are you rotating them frequently onto newer pasture? Is the pasture like very green and lush or is it just like a desert, you know? <laughs> um, another thing is if you do use supplemental feed, I mean, the best is like, are you using like corn and soy free? supplemental feed you know like the thing is they can use like alfalfa barley uh chicken um sesame seeds as well on top of the uh the chicken eating the worms the bugs the mineral content from the ground so that's going to help even out the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio and kind of yep. make it less inflammatory yeah but most most people go for the cheapest option to make money yeah yeah that's so yeah Exactly. Corn and so soy. The, 
like a typical price for like a full chicken that's properly pasture pasture raised and corn and soy free would be like 30 to 40 bucks for a whole chicken just to give you an idea mm -hmm. of like the rough ballpark you should be seeing you know for a full chicken like for They're like 10 or 11 bucks for in the supermarket yeah exactly maybe at costco even cheaper yeah like six. Maybe at costco they just throw in throw one in for free if you buy if you buy more than a hundred dollars <laughs> I know. No, they don't do that, but I'm just kidding. I know. So that, that basically goes with all meats, though. You want to look for pasture raised, eating a species specific diet. And if they do have supplemental feed, make sure it's not corn and soy because that really wreaks havoc on the animals omega 3 to omega 6 and other nutritional factors. Yeah, exactly. That's the big takeaway. So just make sure is the animal fed its species specific diet? Are they roaming around on pasture? Are you, what kind of, if you're using any kind of chemicals, what are you using? Like uh, antibiotics or um, other medicines or vaccines. And then you just have to figure out if you're okay with those being used or not. Nice. And then he goes into it a lot more in his book. He also has got a section on GMOs, supplements, water, um, biomagnification and toxic load. But I'll let you guys read the book to find out about that. What I want to know is, I know you did some research on what's more expensive because the most common myth I hear, well, it's not a myth, but the most common thing I hear from people is that organic is too expensive. And most of those people that say that don't even buy organic at all. So I know you did some research. Let's, let's hear what you found. Yeah. Uh, basically I went to kind of like a higher end, like a uh, organic grocery store and they sold like a bunch of organic options also locally grown organic options and then also a bunch of factory farmed options kind of like mm -hmm. one of those half and half stores so it's called sprouts farmers market so it's kind of a higher end organic and um basically i standardized a 2000 calorie diet so the same amount of protein fat and carbs per 2000 calorie factory farm diet and supermarket level organic diet and the price difference was like for the factory farmed one. I mean, you have the numbers in the book. I don't remember exactly. It was like $7 and 77 cents. Yeah. And then for the supermarket organic one, it was uh, like $12 something. Twelve ninety. Yeah. twelve ninety. So that's roughly like a $5 difference. So yeah. some people would go like, Oh, see, I told you organic is more expensive. It's $5 more expensive. Yeah. Okay. But let's, let's break that down in a little bit more detail. So from my observation, people that don't shop organic, also tend to eat out way more. Yeah. Okay. So what's one meal at like McDonald's? It's like 10 bucks, maybe even more. Yeah. Okay. So remember for one day, you can get 2000 calories of all organic produce for like 12 bucks. Okay. Now you just spent, what, what, what's that coffee every morning you're buying at Starbucks costs like five bucks. So oh, right yes. there with one McDonald's meal, one, one cup, cup of coffee, that's 15 bucks. How much does, is, I mean, is that iPhone really adding that much more value to your life? Are you running like a huge high-end business that you need to spend 100 to 150 bucks a month on your phone? Mm -hmm. You know, that's another expense. Um, just going out and like drinking at a bar every weekend is probably like 200 bucks a weekend. That's $10,000 yeah. a year. Yep. But the, people would be okay with buying like a $15 alcohol drink at like some lame bar and yeah, not even it, think twice about it you know or but then th like but a three dollar bottle of water isn't worth it <laughs> yeah exactly Ex exactly so the problem there is more over people's core priorities are just all over the place these days mm -hmm. um i mean the general core priorities of the average citizen i don't agree with i don't think it's it's healthy at all and the results speak for themselves i mean you don't even have to you don't even have to listen to me. Just go out anywhere in America. I mean, literally like anywhere. And uh, easily like nine out of 10 people you see are like full of like mental and physical pain, like full of disease, you know? Mm -hmm. But I, so, I think, I think the reason people don't want to spend more on organic is because there's a lot of confusion on whether or not it's healthy for you or if it's healthier. So that's why I think everyone should go out and purchase this book. Um, why don't you talk about how much research you did? How long did you, how many farms did you visit? How many, how long did you work on a farm? A little bit more about that before we get out yeah. of here. So I grew up 
on a biodynamic farm in Ukraine. And then also, like I volunteered, luckily enough, I found a biodynamic farmer here in Laguna Beach. So it's very close to where I live. And then he let me volunteer on that farm for quite a while. Uh, it was called Bluebird Canyon Farms. Uh, nice. Very nice, very nice guy to let me do that. And then just a lot of a lot of research on my own, you know, like just reading a bunch of books, interviewing like a bunch of people in the industry as well. Um, obviously listening to like a lot of Paul Czech stuff. He's very like anti-factory farm uh, guy as well. Joel mm-hmm. Salatin. Uh, I'm actually going to be doing a podcast with him on Tuesday. Nice. Um, uh, stuff of that sort, you know, like a good, a good resource a person can buy as well. It's called uh, the Joel Salatin Semester Series. And it basically teaches you how to be a pasture-raised farmer. This isn't for people that want to be a pasture-raised farmer, but at least you'll know what to look for yep. when going to a small farmer. Because mm-hmm. it's not enough just to go to a small farmer because you have to know like what to look for. You know what I mean? When you go there or they can just tell you like, bam, anything like tell you, whatever, if you don't yeah. know. Yeah. If you don't know if like, what is the animal species specific diet? Like if they're telling you like, Oh, I feed them corn and soy. You're like, okay. You know? Bye. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, um, stuff of that sort. That's, that's about it. So sweet. So like I said, this book is perfect for anyone who's, who knows what to eat, but they don't know where to get it from. And I'll go ahead and provide the links to some of the resources you have getting mentioned. And I'll definitely provide a link to this on Amazon. I think it's like $14. I think the Kindle. Yeah. The physical yeah. copy, I think is like $21. Or okay, cool. And so, it does come with a video series as well. Like extensive yeah, video I got series. that video series. It's basically a first person, what to look for series from, Yevgeny, and he goes through each section that I mentioned and just tells you books to read, resources to get, and what to look for at the supermarket. So thanks, Yevgeny, for your time, and it was really nice talking to you. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dylan.